Hello everyone. So today we will be seeing about gas dynamics part of the jet uh, gate aerospace uh, paper from 2014 and uh, 15. So myself Akshay. So first we will see about uh, 2014 paper. So in 2014 there were uh, around five questions being asked uh, relatively more number of problems from gas dynamics topic. So totaling uh, about eight marks. So let us try to see the questions. Here, the question one says, for envisaged supersonic flow over a diamond-shaped airfoil, as shown in the figure, which statement is correct among the following? So there are four options given. The option A says, aerofoil will experience zero lift and positive drag force. Aerofoil will experience positive lift and zero drag force. Aerofoil will experience negative lift and zero drag force. Aerofoil will experience positive lift and positive drag force. So since only the angles are given, the Mach number is not given. It is not easy to quantify it, but qualitatively, we can approach this problem. See, so first what I do is, first I will try to uh, analyze what happens in the upper side of the aerofile, that is this section. This section and this section. Then we will try to see what happens in the downstream section. So downside of the airfoil. So if I try to draw the given information, so I have a airfoil. Kind of exaggerating is fine. So this is my solid body. So now I have a flow. Which is coming in this direction. Right. So if I make a parallel to the flow, this will be my parallel direction. So this will be my geometric turn angle theta right for this upper surface so now you see as the flow comes it sees a corner that is convex in nature that means like flow has to expand through a corner here right so that means what i am going to see here is i am going to see a expansion fan as the flow sees the upper surface, right? So across the expansion fan, we know that, we know that this theta is going to be something around total 10 degree with the axis, axis, total 10 degree minus 5 degree. So theta is going to be 5 degree. So the expansion happens and Across the expansion, if I say this is my P1 upstream, so up, up, across the expansion fan, I will see PU, that is uh, upper surface uh, pressure, I will denote as U, PU1, that is going to be less than P1 because it's an expansion, right? Now, what is my flow direction? The flow will be parallel to the surface of the aerofile. So, so now flow direction is parallel to this one, right? So now you see, again this, for this flow, this is horizontal line, local horizontal. For this flow, again it sees an expansion corner, right? Because it has to turn to make it to parallel to this surface. So if that is the case, 
then again what i am going to see i am going to see a expansion fan over here right so if this is again expansion what happens so i get a pressure say pu2 which will be still less than pu1 because again flow is expanded that means this is my m1 m2 which is greater than m1 m3 which is greater than m2 so it is accelerating on the upper surface so now we see what happens in the downside of the aerofoil right so in the downside of the aerofoil something like this this is my aerofoil body being axis of the aerofoil okay so now you see as flow comes it sees a corner which is which is a compression corner right it's a concave corner where flow has to bend in a way that it has to compress now so that means what i am going to see i am going to see an oblique shock forming over here with a shock angle beta and what is my geometric turn this is my if i draw the horizontal so then this is going to be geometric turn theta so i have theta beta and this is my m1 with upstream pressure p1 right so now as soon as flow passes through a oblique shock wave what happens pressure has to rise right this flow becomes parallel to this one so my downstream condition to oblique is pl1 i will call for the lower surface of the aerofoil which is greater than p1 right so now what happens when the flow comes to this corner when the flow comes to this corner again flow has to be parallel to this one so if it has to be parallel to this one so then it has to see a expansion corner across which flow can turn right so i will get a pressure let us call it as pl2 which will be less than pl1 if pl2 is less than pl1 but i don't know whether pl2 is less than p1 or greater than p1 it is completely governed by what mark number i am going to get but i don't have any information over here but here i have a mark number m2 l that will be less than m1 but i have m3 in the lower surface which will be greater than ml2 sorry m2 l right so that's the scenario now we analyze if i club upper surface and the lower surface together what's happening in the upper surface i have a pressure which is less com compared to the lower surface that means there is pressure difference that is pl1 minus pu1 which is greater than 0 that means a pressure is acting in this direction so that gives me a positive lift so one part and again if i see between uh, the shock wave and the upstream of the uh, flow then again i have pl1 minus p1 which is again greater than 0 this is going to contribute towards positive drag this increase in pressure will be much much higher compared to the decrease in pressure because the geometric angle theta is here 10 plus 5 that is 15 degree whereas the expansion corner has only 5 degree so this this is higher so the compression is stronger compared to an expansion so i should get a positive drag 
because of the uh, presence of shock wave compression shock wave right so if i look back the given option option d is correct because aerofoil will experience both positive lift and positive drag right everybody clear right Yes. So let us move to the next question. Here you see, consider a supersonic uh, flow near a corner at an angle theta from the horizontal with an attached oblique shock at an angle beta with the horizontal as shown in the figure. If the Mach number m decreases gradually from a high supersonic value, which of the following statements is correct? It's very interesting question. So, I think in 2014 paper, they played with a theory rather than giving any number. Again, we have to do the qualitative analysis here. C. So, option A says beta will decrease if the shock is weak. Beta will, uh, option B, beta will decrease if the shock is strong. Option C, beta will increase for both weak and strong shocks. Option D, beta will remain unchanged for both weak and strong shocks. So it's a classic example of theta beta m relation. So how it uh, turns out. So let us try to analyze this from a theta beta mark uh, uh, map. So that is uh, much more easy. So uh, here I have drawn beta versus theta as a function of different mark numbers. You see for m is equal to 2 and then I have m is equal to 3. Then I have m is equal to so on. So that means in this direction, M is increasing. Similarly, if you see on the upper side, so this will be my detachment uh, angle, this corner. So if I if I see on the upper side, the strong shock region, where M is increasing in this direction. That means now you see, the geometry is fixed with us. with theta being the geometric angle. With this one we are not changing. Only thing we are actually changing is upstream Mach number. So they are given M decreases gradually. So that means if theta is not changing, what happens in the weak shock region? So let us try to draw a line over here saying this is weak shock region. This is a strong shock region. Okay. So now in the weak shock region, let us fix some theta, which covers all the Mach numbers. Let us say, let us try to fix uh, 20 degree. Okay, some theta it is fixed now. Okay, so if you look at this line, this is a theta 20 line. Okay, now you see for a given theta value, if I decrease the Mach number from high value to low value, what is happening? Beta is increasing, right? Beta is increasing. So for weak shock, beta increases with Mach number decreasing, right? Whereas in the shock, uh, strong shock region, you see what is happening. If I decrease the Mach number from high value to low value, high supersonic to low supersonic value, what's happening now? So beta is decreasing, right? With decrease in Mach number. So for strong shock, beta decreases with M decreasing, right? So now look at the options carefully. The first option says beta will decrease if the shock is weak. That is wrong, right? We saw beta increases with decrease in uh, uh, Mach number for a weak shock region. Whereas beta will decrease if the shock is strong shock. That is correct. That part we just saw. This two option obviously not correct because it is it is not going to behave in the same way for both the shocks. The other one is beta is unchanged. That is not possible. Theta beta mark relation clearly suggests 
there is a variation if i keep one variable fixed and the other variable change then it is going to affect beta so in this sense option b is correct so clear right yes let us try to see the next question this is a numerical this question is quite interesting let us try to discuss this question now more carefully a student needs to find velocity across a stationary shock he measures density and pressure across the shock as shown in the figure below 1 bar is equal to 10 to the power of 5 pascal no shock table is needed for the calculations the value of u1 in meters per second is okay let us try to solve this question by an approach which all of you might uh, go with right that is uh, uh, what you might start with okay so i know p2 i know p1 i know rho2 i know uh, rho1 so from here what i can do is i can calculate temperature t1 that is equal to p divided by rho r right p1 by so p is equal to rho r t uh, equation of state i am using so from here i can calculate what is t1 so now you see i know p2 by p1 can be written as 1 plus 2 gamma divided by gamma plus 1 times m1 square minus 1 from normal shock relations right so from here i can rearrange for uh, mach number so that becomes p2 by p1 minus 1 into gamma plus 1 divided by 2 gamma plus 1 to the power of 1 by 2 is equal to m1 so from here you can calculate m1 so if you plug in p2 is 29 p1 is 1 you will get 29 minus 1 that is 28 28 into this per so you will get something around 25 to the power of 1 by 2 is equal to m1 so you will get m1 is equal to 5 that is fine so now you can calculate what is u1 u1 can be written as m1 into speed of sound gamma r t1 or I, you can also write m1 square root of gamma by gamma times p by rho p1 by rho1 so if you put the numbers 5 into square root of 1.4 into 1 bar 1 bar is given as uh, 10 to the power of 5 pascal divided by uh, rho1 that is 1.2 kg per meter cube if you plug in this number you will get 1707 0.83 meter per second answer wise it is right approach wise also it is right the only problem i have here is in this case i assume whatever gas uh, we are treating here as air with gamma is equal to 1.4 is it specified in the question is nowhere specified what gamma i have to take right because it is not specified it is air they are just saying a student is measured density and pressure values across the shocks across the shock he they didn't specify whether he is uh, dealing with air as a perfect gas or any other gas i absolutely have no idea whether gamma is 1.4 or not this is the assumption we took and we went along in this question luckily that is coming correct because uh, they also might have used air only here but they did not mention but i'm i'm saying here this approach is bit of problematic if other than air is given in the problem because then this gamma plays a major role that changes your answer all other numbers might be in the same range but gamma if you change it can give you a different answer so instead of that one we will try to approach this problem from more fundamental perspective that is much more uh, uh, appropriate right so i have a continuity for 1d flow i can easily assume 1d study flow 
steady adiabatic flow. It is not a problem. So if I assume that I can have continuity given by rho one u one is equal to rho two u two, right? So from here, what I can do? I can write u one by u two equal to rho two by rho one. So rho two is given six. Rho one is given one point two. So it gives me u one by u two as five. Clear? So u one by u two is equal to five. Now, if I use the momentum equation, so for one D flow, P one plus rho one u one square is equal to P two plus rho two u two square. So from here, what I can do? I can write P two minus P one is equal to rho one u one square minus rho two u two square. So now, if I take If I write this one like rho one u one times u one minus rho two u two times u two, what is rho two u two? Rho two u two can also be written as rho one u one from the continuity. So I can easily take rho one u one common. So that gives me u one minus u two. So again, if you see, if I take u one common from here, so that becomes rho one u one square times one minus U two by U one equal to P two minus P one, right? So now U two by U one we already know that is five. The only unknown in this equation is U one. So we will rewrite it for U one. So that is U one square is equal to P two minus P one divided by rho one times one minus U two by U one. So now you see, I can easily write U one is equal to square root of p two minus p one divided by rho one times one minus u two by u one. So this is equal to square root of p two is twenty nine minus one. That is going to be that's right. Twenty nine minus one into converting into a Pascal. Ten to the power of five divided by rho one is one point two kg per meter cube, one minus one by five. So if you plug in, you should be able to get u one as one seven zero seven point eight three meters per second. So this is a much more reliable approach because here we haven't assumed any properties, right? Like Which gas we are using? What gamma we have to use? Nothing. We are just approaching from a fundamental perspective. We have just applied a control volume approach across the shop. We use the flow variables given in the problem. Nothing else. So, which is much more reliable approach, irrespective of the gas you are treating, you should be able to get the correct answer. So, you can keep that answer: one seven zero seven point eight three meter per second. So clear. Okay, let us try to move on to the next part. This is again very interesting question. Again, I am going to show you the two approaches for this problem. Okay, one is a direct formula based, other one is a fundamental side. Even if you stuck in the question, you can actually approach for this kind of problem if your fundamentals are correct. So you don't have to worry. So that that part I am going to show here. Okay, so what is the question? For inviscid compressible flow past a thin airfoil, shown in figure, free stream Mach number and pressure are denoted by m infinity and p infinity respectively. The ratio of pressure at point A and P naught is 0.8, and specific heat ratio is 1.4. If the Mach number at point A is 1.0 and the rest of the flow field is subsonic, the value of m infinity is. So for this particular question. they are given p a divided by p infinity s 0.8 one condition and mach number at point a is 
and rest of the flow field they are saying it is subsonic so that means i am going to induce uh, assumption is this study inviscid and compressible assumption they are already given so i am also saying it is adiabatic and since there is no shock wave which is forming over here because the rest of the flow field is subsonic so there is no way you can have a shock wave so i can treat it to be reversible also because it is inviscid so there is no way uh, like we can safely say it is also reversible because there is no irreversibility is involved in the given problem so that means combining this one it is isentropic right isentropic steady flow over a air of i so from this uh, question we can easily uh, make this assumption now we see what i am going to do here i am going to take one streamline which is going to point a okay now i am applying a energy balance between infinity state to point a so that means i can easily apply energy balance that means from adiabatic flow assumption h infinity plus v infinity square by 2 is equal to h a plus p a square divided by 2 this uh, this uh, balance we can always make so this equation now if i write in terms of temperature assuming it's calorically perfect gas so i can write t infinity plus v infinity square divided by 2 cp equal to t a plus v a square divided by 2 cp clear so now what i am going to do is i am going to take uh, t infinity minus t a as 1 divided by 2 cp times v a square minus v infinity square right so if i take t infinity out here this becomes 1 minus t a divided by t infinity which is equal to 1 divided by 2 cp let us try to write like this only v a square minus v infinity square divided by 2 cp right so if i take t infinity to other side and now my flow field is isentropic i can use the isentropic relation right t a by t infinity as t a by p infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma so i can replace this one is 1 minus p a by p infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma which is equal to v a square what is v a square we know at point a mark number is 1 that means v a is also equal to speed of sound at point a right so i can write it to be gamma r t a divided by cp can be written as gamma r divided by gamma minus 1 times t infinity i am taking to the other side t infinity minus again this is v infinity square divided by 2 into gamma r divided by gamma minus 1 times t infinity right so now you see this gamma r this gamma r get cancels again i am left with t a by t infinity what is this one gamma r t infinity a infinity is nothing but root of gamma r t infinity right so this is nothing but a infinity square so you see now this is t a by t infinity minus v infinity square uh, again there is one more term 2 by gamma minus 1 this multiplying multiplying divided by gamma minus 2 by gamma minus 1 times a infinity square so if i take this uh, gamma minus 1 by 2 common that is nothing but t a by t infinity which can be written as p a by p infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma minus v infinity square by a infinity square that is nothing but m infinity square that is mark number definition right so left hand side i have 1 minus p 
PA by P infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma. So now, except M infinity, everything is known to us because in the problem it is given PA by P infinity as 0.8. So express this equation in terms of Mach number. If I express in terms of Mach number, what happens? Take to other side. 2 by gamma minus 1 times 1 minus Pa by P infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma equal to Pa by P infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma minus M infinity square. So take m infinity square to the left hand side and all either this term to this other side you should be able to get m infinity is equal to square root of pa by p infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma minus 2 by gamma minus 1 times 1 minus Pa by P infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma. Right? So now you keep all the numbers. This is 0 0.8, gamma 1.4. So you should be able to get M infinity as 0 0.793. This is from fundamental perspective. Okay, we... We started with energy balance and we proceeded and we used isentropic relation in between, right? So this is very straightforward uh, way to approach, but bit lengthier, it is fine, but we are not making any mistakes here. So it's more fundamental approach. As I said earlier, I can also show an alternative approach for this problem. alternative approach. What I am going to do is in the question it is given Pa divided by P infinity as 0 0.8. What is Pa actually? At A, Ma is 1. So that means Pa by Pa is nothing but P star, right? That is a sonic condition. So what I am going to do here, I am multiplying and dividing by P naught to this equation. So that becomes Pa by P0 divided by P infinity divided by P0. P0, which is equal to 0 0.8. And what is P star by P0? P star by P0 is nothing but 2 divided by gamma plus 1 to the power of gamma by gamma minus 1. Right? If m is equal to 1, P, P star by P0, you can write like this. And what is P infinity by P naught, which can also be written as 1 divided by 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 times m infinity square to the power of gamma by gamma minus 1. So you replace that one. So that means Pa by P infinity that is equal to 0 0.8. Let us write like this. Pa by P infinity, which can be written as 2 by gamma plus 1 to the power of gamma by gamma minus 1 times 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 times. So like denominator, the denominator goes to numerator m infinity square to the power of gamma by gamma minus 1. So now this part is known. So you write Pa by P infinity into gamma plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of gamma by gamma minus 1 equal to 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 times m infinity square to the power of gamma by gamma minus 1. So now express in terms of m infinity square. So, so take the gamma by gamma minus 1 to other side. It becomes Pa by P infinity to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma times gamma plus 1 divided by 2 
minus 1 whole multiplied with 2 by gamma minus 1 is equal to m infinity square. So now you keep all the numbers. This is 0 0.8 gamma 1.4. So you should be able to get again m infinity is equal to 0 0.793. This is a slightly shorter approach. If you can recognize this is a sonic condition and if you can remember this formula directly, you can plug in and you can get the answer. Or else always we have the option approaching from the fundamental perspective. Just the energy balance and we proceed. So everybody clear, right? Yes. So let us move to the next question. This problem we actually solved uh, in our uh, propulsion part. So since it's also a gas dynamic uh, problem in more, in more general. So let us try to re relook this problem quickly. So an aircraft is flying at Mach number 3 at an altitude where, an, where the ambient pressure and the temperature are 50 kilopascal and 200 Kelvin respectively. If the converging diverging diffuser of the engine considered isentropic with the ratio of specific heat is uh, uh, gamma 1.4 and specific gas constant R is 287 joules per kg Kelvin, has a throat area of 0 0.05 meter square, the mass flow rate through the engine in kgs per second is. So what is given? I have an aircraft which is equipped with supersonic diffuser, which is converging diverging. With an inlet, this is throat. So A star is given. Since it's supersonic, uh, slowing down to a subsonic value, the diffuser, that means it has to choke somewhere. The minimum area, that is A star, is going to be 0 0.05 meter square. What is given? P is, uh, uh, say like it is P infinity, is given to be 50 kilopascal T infinity static temperature at the upstream is given 200 Kelvin and Mach number at which flow is entering is given 3.0. So from here you can calculate P naught and T naught respectively. How we can calculate P naught? P naught is nothing but P infinity times 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 times m infinity square to the power of gamma by gamma minus 1. Similarly, T naught can be calculated as T infinity times 1 plus gamma minus 1 by 2 times m infinity square. Right? So, these two variables we can easily calculate. So, if I have to write it for mass flow rate, so I can take any one section in the nozzle. So it is obvious choice is to take the throat section because area is given over there. So I can write rho star, A star, V star, where V star is also equal to A star, which can be written as gamma R, V star, right? So rho star, I am multiplying and dividing by rho naught. So I can write in terms of rho star by rho naught times rho naught, I am again writing in terms of P naught by RT naught using uh, perfect gas uh, relation, uh, state relation, P is equal to rho RT. That's I'm using over here, times A star, again V star, I'm writing in terms of speed of sound, gamma R, again multiplying and dividing by T naught, right? So now I can take root RT naught common, here one RT naught is there, so that gives me mass flow rate is Rho star by rho naught can be written in terms of 2 by gamma plus 1 to the power of 1 by gamma minus 1. And uh, P naught as it is divided by root RT naught, taking root RT naught common from the numerator times root gamma times again T 
T star by T naught can be written as 2 by gamma plus 1, but it is inside the square root, so it is 1 by 2 times A star. Right? So now I can take an LCM of this power, 1 by gamma minus 1, 1 by 2. That gives me 2 by gamma plus 1 to the power of gamma plus 1 divided by 2 times gamma minus 1 times P naught divided by root of RT naught times root gamma times a star. Now everything is known to us. P naught we can calculate. So we calculated from uh, given uh, information, Mach number and uh, gamma value and uh, P infinity value. So that is going to be. So if I if you guys calculate, you should be able to get P naught as uh, one eight three six point six four kilo pascal remember not just pascal and t naught is going to be 560 kelvin so if you plug in those numbers r287 gamma 1.4 a star 0 0.05 meter square you should be able to get mass flow rate as 157 close to 157 it's going to be 156.85 kgs per second so if you look back the question i have an option d that is close to that answer right so clear right this question we already solved in uh, propulsion but uh, since it is uh, more related to gas dynamics i read it uh, that question over here so clear okay let us move on to the 2015 was uh, gate paper so in 2015 we actually had very less number of problems so like two one mark questions and one two mark question totaling about four marks so this is very very short uh, uh, in terms of gas dynamics part in only four marks so let us uh, try to see the question okay an ideal gas in a reservoir has a specific stagnation enthalpy of H0. The gas is isentropically expanded to a new specific stagnation enthalpy of H0 by 2 and velocity u. The flow is one dimensional and steady. Then u square by H0 is. This is very uh, interesting question, bit confusing too. Because you cannot have like stagnation plus velocity, right? If it is stagnation, that means you are going to keep that like velocity is approaching to zero that's how you define it the, what they're trying to say here is i have a reservoir from here it is expanded kind of the thing okay or within the reservoir it is expanded initially i had stagnation enthalpy h naught with velocity u is zero then it expanded to H0 by 2 with velocity u. Okay. So now if I upload, apply the energy balance because the flow is one dimensional and steady. So for that one, I can easily use H0 plus say it, uh, U0 square divided by 2, which is also equal to new stagnation state H0 by 2 plus U square by 2, the velocity u. For that condition so this is zero initially so this becomes h naught minus h naught by 2 equal to u square by 2 so if i take lcm so it becomes h naught by 2 equal to u square by 2 so 2 2 get cancels so that means u square divided by h naught is going to be 1 that is the answer 1 right straightforward clear right Yes. So let us uh, try to move on to the next question. This a rocket nozzle is designed to produce a maximum thrust at an altitude h is equal to 8 kilometer from the sea level. Right. The nozzle operates in there are four 
ऑप्शंस गिवन अंडर एक्सपैंडेड कंडीशन फॉर हेच ग्रेटर देन एट किलोमीटर अंडर एक्सपैंडेड कंडीशन फॉर हेच लेस देन एट किलोमीटर सोनिक एग्जिट कंडीशन फॉर हेच ग्रेटर देन एट किलोमीटर अनचोक्ड कंडीशन फॉर हेच लेस देन एट किलोमीटर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड इट्स अ रॉकेट नॉजल दट मीन्स इट्स अ कन्वर्जिंग डाइवर्जिंग नॉजल लास्ट टू ऑप्शन आर not more uh, relevant over here sonic condition at the exit or unchoked right so now try to analyze for these two condition which one is correct so let us try to control volume okay i have a nozzle geometry with a fixed stagnation chamber pressure p not temperature t not so it is expanding flow to uh, exit condition with exhaust velocity ve jet velocity and exit plane pressure pe so since the nozzle geometry is fixed we are not changing anything and we are not changing this res reservoir condition to or the stagnation chamber pressure and temperature condition so for this nozzle with this upstream condition the mass flow at this point is always going to be same not changing and similarly the exit mark number is also not going to change this is same constant right so now for this one that means my p not by pe is function of mark number right so that means my exit plane pressure is kind of fixed okay and it is designed to operate at 8 km maximum thrust means optimum expansion so that is um, happening at 8 km altitude so at h is equal to 8 km i have pe is equal to pa now we we'll try to see what happens if i vary the altitude so if i have to drop pressure as a function of altitude we know from sea level say somewhere here i have sea level so some pressure i have so as i increase the altitude what happens to a pressure in standard atmospheric condition pressure decreases right as i increase the altitude it kind of decreases to some value so say i have somewhere over here 8 km altitude this is where i have pe is equal to pa this is where i have pa which is greater than pe anything above 8 km altitude i will be having pe which will be less than sorry pe which will be greater than pa right uh, ambient condition so now you see for any nozzle for pe is equal to pa that is optimum expansion what happens if pe is less than pa that means it is over expanded right it expanded to pe whereas your back pressure is just pb sorry pa that is still greater than pe so it is over expanded if you want to make it to this condition then it has to see some kind of a compression shock wave across which it has to increase so it is over expanded nozzle pe less than pa that is the condition that is h less than 8 km so h less than 8 km nozzle is over expanded similarly if it is h greater than 8 km my nozzle is going to have exit pressure that will be less than sorry greater than pa right this condition greater than pa if pe is greater than pa that means it is not it expanded to a back pressure value that means it's under expanded it's still under expansion so it is not expanded fully to pa so it is for h greater than 8 km the nozzle is under expanded so now look at the options carefully option a has 
uh, has to be the right answer, right? Under expanded condition for h greater than eight kilometer. So this is not correct. For less than eight kilometer, eight kilometer, it will be over expanded. So clear. Yes. So let us move on to the next question. This is our last question also. For a normal shock, the relation between the upstream Mach number M1 and downstream Mach number M2 is given by M2 square is equal to the expression is given to you. For an ideal gas with gamma as 1.4, the asymptotic value of the downstream Mach number is. What do we mean by an asymptotic value? When the variable approaches to infinity, right? That is what we call it as an asymptote. So that means if M1 tends to infinity, what happens to M2? That is what they are asking here. So I have an expression like this. M2 square. Let us say limit M1 tending to infinity. What happens to M2 square? That is limit M1 tending to infinity gamma minus 1 times m1 square plus 2 divided by 2 gamma m1 square plus 1 minus gamma. That's fine. So now you see if I apply the limit directly it will shoot up infinity by infinity form. So what I am going to do now is I am going to take m1 square outside from numerator and denominator before applying the limit. So that means M1 square if I take outside, it becomes gamma minus 1 plus 2 by M1 square divided by again M1 square I am taking outside, it becomes 2 gamma plus 1 minus gamma. So this and this can be cancelled out as limit M1 tends to 0, 1 by infinity tends to 0. So again I have M1 square here. So this is again 1 by infinity goes to 0. So I am left with gamma minus 1 by 2 gamma. That is equal to m2 square, remember. So I have m2 square is equal to gamma minus 1 divided by 2 gamma. So now if I take the square root, so m2 is going to be gamma minus 1 by 2 gamma as M1 tends to infinity. So now gamma is given to you in the question. If you put the number 1.4 over here, so you should be able to get M2 becomes 0.378. So you can keep that number over here. Clear? Okay, so that's that ends our discussion on uh, gas dynamics question from 2014 and 15 paper. So if you guys have any doubt, you can ask or you can wind up the session. Thank you for your attendance. And probably this is our last uh, session together. So you guys have exam uh, day after tomorrow. All the best with that.